Hi, this is Trisha from Tribe to Village. This is our tribe, our village, our family. And today we're joined by Jeanette Montez, mother of two. Hi, Jeanette. Hey. <laughs> so Jeanette is here today to share her traumatic experience when she gave birth to her second, her first child, right, Jeanette? My first, yeah. Her first son, and it was a trying time for her. But Jeanette was able to persevere and with the support of the doctors and family and friends, she was able to make it through. And now she has a second handsome bouncing baby boy, right? I do. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeanette, can you tell us a little bit about your first experience? Sure. So I had a very typical pregnancy. Um, I had a OB that was overseeing my care. He was a private practice. So it was only him and his wife. So it was very personal one-on-one. -on -one. I knew who was going to wow. deliver my baby. Um, but yeah, very uneventful pregnancy. Uh, mm -hmm. I went and so I, my doctor had offered a membrane sweep and I chose to take that. And so what is the membrane sweep? For, so membrane sweep um, for me, it was really not painful. They kind of go in and they separate where I guess the waters are from where the uterus is. And they kind of just go in there and like kind of wake it up. It's probably not like medical terms, but it's supposed to stimulate contractions. And it did, it worked. It, it's working. Um, and that's when, yeah. So I was like, Oh, I'll leave her at home. That's what I had planned and then go to the hospital. But things changed really quickly. I started bleeding more mm -hmm. than just your typical bloody show. And I kind of thought, okay, that's a little odd. So I mm -hmm. called my doctor and as I'm on the phone with my doctor, it had only been two hours since I was having contractions, but they were so close together and so mm -hmm. painful. Like I'm talking, I was on the phone with my doctor for maybe a minute and I had mm -hmm. about four contractions. Like wow. they were coming really strong, really hard. I couldn't stand and I'm bleeding. So wow. we went to the hospital in the morning and when we got there, it was me, my husband, and my doula, because this was back in 2017, where you could have mm -hmm. people in the room with you, and it was fine. So, Jeanette, so quick, quick mm -hmm. question. You called your doctor and told you, and you told him that you were bleeding. He didn't say mm -hmm. go to the hospital right away. He said it was okay for you to stay home a little longer. Yeah, he wasn't super concerned. And my guess is because it was, that does happen when you get the bloody show with the contractions and your cervix is expanding, whatever. But I think what concerned him was that I could not talk between my contractions. Mm -hmm. I had a pause on the phone and they were like maybe sometimes 10 seconds apart, lasting for a little oh, bit. Wow. Yeah. So they were really close together and I, he could tell that something was not right. So he told me to go to the hospital. Okay. So, so as soon as you got off the phone with him, he told you to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. So that's what we did. And we got there in the morning, um, still having contractions. Uh, I, di I didn't have an epidural, so I'm still feeling everything moving around. And mm -hmm. it was painful, and I'm bleeding a lot. So I'm going, like, mm -hmm. through labor, and I'm going through chucks, like those chucks they put on the bed for you. Yeah. And I'm, yeah. I'm bleeding, and no one really seemed to be concerned. And mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know what's normal and what's not. Yeah. Um, so they let me kind of like, they would come in periodically and check me the nurses. And then like, I got to a point where I felt like I started to want to push mm. and I hadn't, my water hadn't broken yet. So I wound up moving around and that one of the nurses came in and I remember her telling me, Oh, your belly is a little hard and I'm having back pain. Um, a lot of like symptoms that like would indicate a placenta abruption while it's happening and she didn't seem to be concerned because they let me labor and go on but oh, wow. my, wa my water broke and after that they were like all right let's start pushing because they really didn't check me for dilation too much so my guess is I was ready to push so by the time we got on the table and now we're pushing and I can tell the tone in the room kind of shifted like a little really? bit and wow. the baby's heart rate was fine so I knew it wasn't that but doctors started to come in and residents started to come in and kind of like, oh. and we're, and I'm bleeding a lot. So I, and I also mm -hmm. know that I'm starting to lose energy because as I'm pushing, I don't even remember how long the pushing phase lasted for me, but I got to a point where like, I can't do this anymore. Like I'm really tired. So they had a vacuum John out 
and that got him out and he was not breathing very well he took him off to the NICU right away Wow. And, and you were just there like what's going on what just happened mm-hmm. I'm kind I wasn't in a state of shock but almost like probably getting close to that point and then I went and I told them I said I had to use the bathroom after they had put a catheter in and after I used the bathroom I passed out on the toilet bowl <laughs> you passed out? yes oh, I lost no. consciousness like, because of my blood loss so yeah, I, I wound up having two transfusions and that helped, oh. but also now I have a baby in the NICU and mm-hmm. I'm in triage and mm-hmm. just waiting there for blood transfusions and trying to process like what happened because I had no idea what happened. So how did they explain this to you? Because you were just there. You don't know what to expect. This is your first baby and no yeah. one said anything. No one said anything. They didn't like, and I know that there's also, I'm sure they have to cover their butts too. If there was anything that was malpractice, maybe like for me, when thinking back, when I talk about this sometimes, and I, I mean, my doctor wouldn't admit this. And I really, I did trust my doctor. I still do that doctor, but the decision to let me go as long as they did Mm-hmm. probably wasn't great they probably could have done a c-section a little earlier and it would have prevented john from having issues but who knows god only knows that John had a lot of complications we didn't know we didn't know what was happening at first because i was just sitting there in a hospital bed they took mm-hmm. my placenta to a lab and that's so it, the lab came back and that's how they knew it was a placenta abruption that happened during labor i mean john doesn't have any of the issues that some babies might come out with where they lose oxygen for too long and then Mm -hmm. they wind up with like cerebral palsy or other or other issues but I mean he was in the NICU he he required blood and platelet transfusions as well um he they had him on a cooling we couldn't hold him for like four days because they were trying to bring his body temperature in case down in case there was any brain swelling that Uh was like a protocol that they used so he was in that for four days and then they were also just like suctioning blood out of his stomach. Um, and then they kept him for those 18 days because his stats were constantly floating. And I guess his his blood levels, I don't know if that's the right word to say, but he required like blood transfusions and platelet transfusions over that time. And then wow. the testing. So there was like MRIs, EEGs, uh, EKG, because he did have a slight heart defect that was unrelated. So getting all these like tests to happen within a time frame, mm-hmm. you know, it, it did take a little bit, but he came home and it was fine once he came home and he got, wow. he was cleared from all of those professionals uh-huh. like neurology. I can't imagine the feelings that you had to have your, your firstborn in the mm-hmm. NICU when you're there and you're bleeding, you don't know what's going on with your body. It's a, mm-hmm. it's a lot. So can you like I said, I can't imagine, but you're here. So can you tell us how the feelings that you were experiencing, the thoughts that you were experiencing during that moment, that period of time? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing I wanted to know was like, what is a placenta abruption? Like I had no idea. And then I found out what happens is, like I said, the placenta tears away from the uterus, sometimes completely, sometimes partially mine was partial i mean it's hard to tell how much but yeah i wanted to know what that was what what were the risk factors did i have any of those risk factors and And i would say yes and no what were the risk factors yeah so some of them were like illicit drug use alcohol use which i knew that wasn't me i didn't fit that category um Mm -hmm. but some of them were very general like high Mm -hmm. blood pressure or being obese or maybe having a a previous issue with the placenta but then I I, as I started to read more it could have been heavy lifting it could have been a car accident per se and I and I did move but I wasn't really lifting anything heavy I I had we had moving company and family doing all that so So it's trauma to your room no and some some things I read maybe learn so I really didn't fit all the 
characteristics. And I don't know if maybe I did in some other ways or was it a freak accident? Was there something I could do? Because that's what I wanted to know. Was there yeah. something I could do to prevent this from happening if mm. I ever wanted to go down that road again? Because mm. that was really scary at the time. Yeah. So I kind of went down that road. I have read that people have had repeat Mm-hmm. abruption it was like where I was like oh like what about another child mm-hmm. and that's when like fear would kind of come on because they did tell me to wait 18 months uh-huh. before tr- before trying just so everything could heal um okay. so I knew that 18 months so when that like time frame kind of came around it would be like I don't know I don't know if like and JP was really like my husband was really like sensitive to that because I mean, he, he saw how traumatic it was and, and it was scary and it, it would, it would trigger me to think about having that happen again. Mm -hmm. And like, what if that did happen again? Would it be worse the second time? Mm -hmm. You could have lost your life. You know, Mm -hmm. you have lost his life. So it's something that is beyond traumatic. Exactly. About happening again. Exactly. And I would say around that time, uh, I think John was about two years old when we really started to consider it again. And really like just for us, like just praying about it, talking about it. And you talk about everything, like what if it did happen again? Like, let's go through that a little bit. Let's not entertain it because we don't know, but let's talk about it. And, you know, why do we want to have another child? Like, is it that the child is going to come out perfect and, you know, fulfill what we wanted? Um, or is it to love the child? And I think we came uh-huh. down to that conclusion that it was like, okay, if this happened again, yeah. then we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Or maybe there's some things we can do along the way to prevent it. If that was a possibility. Yeah. So we tried and, <laughs> and we did happen. have another baby. It didn't happen again. Oh, uh, yeah, it didn't happen again. Nothing to that extent. I was monitored very closely. I did. I do tend to like lean towards that holistic side of, of lifestyle. I'm not yeah, that's anything. Okay. I'm not yeah. anything crazy, but it's just how yeah. I kind of roll. But, you are uh, crazy. That's, that's your choice, your prerogative. <laughs> it's true, right? <laughs> So I I chose a midwife who did accept me into her practice. We talked about everything. And I will say the first conversation I had with her, I Mm -hmm. broke down in tears. Like I thought I was, yeah, I thought I was over the, the situation, but talking about it, having to go back into that closet and like read the papers and, and Mm -hmm. give the papers, you know, give all my medical Uh information over. And I'm reading through this again. And it it definitely triggered me. Yeah. I did kind of have to face that again. And I was already pregnant at this time. So I'm like, here we are. Oh, but, the hormones <laughs> on top of it. Yes. <laughs> but it went well. Every I was monitored like with a few more sonograms. I mean, same thing, a very uneventful pregnancy. But yeah, so- yeah it's... Jeanette, I have mm-hmm. to ask. So you, you spoke about it with your husband and you guys came to the conclusion that you'll accept whatever happens, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that's talking about it. But when it actually came time for, you know, to have the baby and the contraction started to come, were you able to stay level headed or did you or did the contractions trigger like the fear from before? Yeah, that's a good question about it. And then there's another thing to be in it. Yeah. So I will say during when I was laboring at home, it was a different feeling like I wasn't having pain. I was comfortable, I guess you could say, but uncomfortable, as you know, how contractions go. So I felt at ease. Like it felt like this is what's supposed to be going on. When I did get to the hospital and I had to like change into the gown and I was in the bathroom and I went to the bathroom, I saw blood. So I did freak out for a second because that blood triggered me. And my midwife was really like reassuring. She's like, no, that was a, a legit bloody show. Like she's like, your cervix is dilating. This is normal. And once that happened, it did relieve me. I went, but I like, I needed to hear that I was doing okay. And that things were okay. Yeah. So, and yeah. so I was asking for a lot of reassurance. And then once the baby was in my arms, I was like, okay, uh-huh. like we're good now. We made it through. Uh-huh. You're so, like, it, it was worth it. It, it was, was worth it. it. Yes. Yeah, Jeanette, if you would give tips to 
someone who's having a very traumatic experience right now in terms of their birth or just life? Like what kind of advice could you give them as someone who's gone through it, processed it and has mm-hmm. come out on the other yeah. side? So tip wise, I mean, I would say I liked my doctor, but I don't know if I would use him again. So mm-hmm. I, I mean, I didn't have that option because I was, I had moved states I, at the time, but you know what, maybe find a professional who's willing to listen to you. And maybe you could, like, if you have the opportunity to calling practices and talking to doctors, and sometimes you can tell, or, or midwives, however you would want to go about mm-hmm. it and seeing if they are listen to you and listen to your story, listen to like what you desire as like your birth dream, I would say, yeah, definitely have someone that listens to you. You want to be under like a practitioner that listens to you. That was really important to me and support having, I I don't think Facebook is for everyone. And I think in this case, it was a really, really small group where you were able to read other people's stories and hear success and hear failures, see what people did, whatever you would write down after your, maybe your first pregnancy that maybe didn't go so well, what changes would I make? And then kind of try to go with that and see if there's anything that you can do to make it better. It's only to improve, you know, and see where that goes. Yeah. And be open, be open to the possibility of things going much better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, have being optimistic, and I'm not saying that was easy. But Mm -hmm. I had to tell myself that like when those negative thoughts would come I would I'd have to stop and I mean they did come sometimes you know you get they creep in and they can easily take over but it's not it's letting them not take over because I think having a practitioner that is on your level and that you trust and is listening to you and listening to your concerns that I think was it helped me a lot too Mm, good and how do you deal with you had one child and you know people they could be very um well-meaning when they Mm -hmm. say oh when is child when is baby number two coming but they (laughs) might not have known all that you've gone through all that you went through so what kind of advice would you give someone who's gone through that experience and they keep getting that oh when are you having another baby (laughs) oh yeah yeah I think for any and you know what that happens with people even when they know your situation and I think people mean well right but it's just one of those questions that you get and in the beginning I don't think anyone asked me that right away they would maybe joke about it like I remember and that kind of did sting a little bit I remember as the nurses were changing shifts while I'm in the middle of like getting stitched up they're like all right see you in two years and I'm like Huh? Oh, like it's those it's those I'm like too soon too soon yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and like certain things stuck with me so uh-huh. yeah so I mean I think you have to take it and maybe just put it on a shelf and like be like you know what they don't they don't understand and that's not always easy but yeah. I think it'll come more and more and if you're willing to give a response that's well thought out if you have the patience and composure to do that you can let people know because sometimes it can be helpful because sometimes people don't have boundaries and they just you know will go yeah with with that kind of stuff and if you're Mm -hmm. if you know that that person would benefit from hearing a little bit of what you went through or however you want to share that situation versus some Mm well-meaning people where you know you can just put it on the shelf and like all right, yes. I'm not going to entertain that. It, this whole thing wasn't easy, but you did yeah. it and you came through it and you have so many blessings in your life. <laughs> after yes, that absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Jeanette, for joining yeah, us. Thank you. Being honest about your experience and showing us that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and that you were born in your traumatic experience and you have so much more to give and experience in life after it. Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks, Trisha. (laughs) (laughs) Let's continue to elevate and grow together. Please like, comment, 
and subscribe and don't forget to hit the notification button so you never miss another inspirational story on Tribe to Village. Bye.